and welcome to our community call on uh, a shared roadmap for the future of RCC. Um, there are lots of different ways that we could hold a conversation about this and uh, several different kinds of conversations that have already been held uh, by the listening circle and the stewardship circle, two, two of the different um, guiding bodies for RCC. But it's really important that we also hold this kind of conversation with all different folks who are stakeholders of many different kinds. So it's great to hear folks who are coming in from new centers, folks that have been very involved in RCC this whole time, and folks that are a little bit outside of an established um, retreat center context, um, because all of your opinions and, and needs are important for us as we develop what it is that we want to do together. Um, I think it would be great to start by uh, introducing ourselves a little bit more specifically around the center that we're coming from, the location, maybe even just one one tidbit about the uh, the number of beds or or the balance between on-site online programming if you're not doing um, on-site programming right now. Uh, because we have fewer people, it'd be great to do that in person uh, talking and not in the chat. I feel like so many meetings, I'm doing that in the chat, but we have the luxury here of doing that face-to-face, uh, voice-to-voice at least. Um, so I'll, I'll start and then we can go around. Yolanda has some issues with the camera, but that's okay, that's all right. I'm glad you're here, Yolanda. Um, my name is Ben, I use he, him pronouns. I'm also located like Susan in Michigan. I'm in Grand Rapids. Um, this is Anishinaabe land. Uh, I've been living here. I was born actually in, in Indiana, just south of here. I've been living here most of my adult life. I've worked with some retreat centers, but I do not work at a retreat center. So I'm the program director for the retreat center collaboration. So for folks like you, Scott, just coming in and wanting to figure out how to connect, I'm, I'm somebody you can reach out to. Happy to help you forge some of those connections or find other resources that you need. Um, and I'm here also to help us kind of design platforms where we can start to do that collectively. So in some ways, I feel like my role is to kind of work myself out of being the center of the hub and let us connect more directly. So that's part of my goal. And I will pass it to Erin. Hello, everyone. Just checking to make sure I'm the only Erin in the room. That's happened a couple of times lately. <laughs> um, I'm Erin McCauley. She, they, any pronouns are fine for me. I tend to lean kind of gender fluid. So. Um, if you want to practice on using different pronouns with me, I'm the person to do it. Um, I'm working with Ben now. I've been working with him for about a month, two months now, almost, um, with the RCC as the new admin assistant. So I'm taking notes. I'm just getting to know everybody and very happy to support the work that you're doing here. So, um, and I will pass it on to, uh, how about Ken Libby? Thanks so much, Aaron, and uh, welcome aboard. Uh, my name is Ken Libby. I'm with the Children's Defense Fund in Tennessee. We own the Alex Haley Retreat Village here in, in, in Tennessee, just north of Knoxville. Um, we have 36 acres and seven cabins. Uh, in the seven cabins, we can hold 36 bed, uh, 36, we have 36 beds in those cabins. Um, we have a dining room for 85 people and a chapel for 250 people. And we have a library that's inside the barn. Um, both the chapel and the library were designed by Maya Lin, who designed the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, DC. Um, and uh, we've been a long-standing retreat center here um, since 1994, when the Children's Defense Fund purchased it from Alex Haley's estate. Um, and, and we've We've been up to 3,500 people in a year uh, visiting this location and, and um, sleeping over, getting trained here and, and, and so forth. Um, thanks so much. And I'm, I'm open to questions if anyone does have any. Um, I'd like to pass it along to Pam. Thanks, Ken. Well, I'm fairly new to this scene. Um, my background is in nonprofit management and I've worked with um, a number of, of organizations um, providing direct service, primarily in the disabilities world, um, but in, in other spaces as well, um, currently in, in uh, mental health spaces. Um, and I've done quite a bit of 
um, traveling and international volunteer work, and I found myself being a consumer of um, many retreat centers. And so now I'm envisioning um, starting a retreat center. I'm still very much in the visioning stage of things, um, conducting focus groups on um, uh, what activists and um, and service providers would look for in a retreat space. Um, Primarily having, well, one key area, because um, I had done humanitarian aid work when I was traveling internationally, and um, coming back into the world after doing that kind of work, coming back into your regular day-to-day -day life is it's a bit of a challenge, and I see um, room for creating um, sacred spaces, healing spaces for folks in that domain, but not exclusively for that audience. So anyway, I'm I'm in the research mode. I'm in getting to know people, getting to know about the industry and um, understanding the need. And, and I can continue to do nonprofit consulting in the meantime. So any projects that folks have where they need help, that my skills might be of use. I'm going to throw my name out there uh, because it helps me learn and it and uh, helps me be of service. Thanks. Oh, I'm going to pass it on to Jenna. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenna Ringelheim. I use she, her pronouns, and I am based in Portland, Oregon. Um, I came to RCC through a couple of different pathways. Um, for the past decade, I've run a national environmental leadership organization um, and I've had the good fortune of partnering with many, many retreat centers all over the country. It was like definitely the highlight of my job was to collaborate with retreat center leaders and just to be in residence at beautiful, incredible places. Um, and for the past year, I've also been serving as a board member um, at the Whidbey Institute, which is a retreat center on Whidbey Island outside and north of Seattle. Um, that center has um, been engaged with RCC conversations for a while. I'm newer into the mix. Um, and that facility has um, space for 42 folks, um, less if you're considering single rooms. Um, and I think what's really special and unique about uh, Whidbey is we use Holacracy as our governance structure, which is a distributed leadership um, format. So if anyone is interested on in that. Um, I'm always looking for other <laughs> folks that are trying to navigate the complexities of running a nonprofit in a very different sort of way. I'm happy to be here. And I will pass it along to Scott. Awesome. Uh, I'm Scott. I represent LaSalle Manor Retreat Center in Plano, Illinois. It's about 80 miles, um, maybe a little less, west of Chicago. Um, and like I said earlier, I just got here in August, uh, August 1st, I started. My predecessor was here for 29 years. Um, so uh, I have big shoes to fill and uh, a lot to learn about this. And I previously worked in higher education. Um, so I'm transitioning to the uh, retreat center life here. Um, we have 55 beds in our dorm, and then our uh, facility is a log cabin that was built in the 1940s as a home for a family from Chicago. And so the bedrooms, we don't use them regularly as bedrooms, but they all have private bathrooms attached to them. We could put air mattresses and things in there and expand to close to 100. Uh, we don't like to do that. That we can. So it's interesting stuff here. Um, I'll pass it to Yolanda. Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, good. Um, so my name is Yolanda Ramirez, and I am the program specialist at Dominican Center Marywood here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I'm also part of the stewardship circle, and I am um, just really glad to be able to help or uplift uh, the, the work of the RCC in, in any which way. So I, I am the listening ear here to help provide support and move along decisions. Um, Leslie, have you gone yet? If not, I, I, I pick you. <laughs> Thanks. 
I haven't. Uh, my name is Leslie Wright. I joined Prairie Woods here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa as the director in the middle of August. So I've just completed a little over 90 days here, um, but was on the board prior. Uh, we have a 72 acre site here in Eastern Iowa. We're an eco-spirituality center founded by Franciscan sisters in the mid nineties. Um, we can host 39 people um, in a combination of guest house and hermitages. Um, typically in a year, we offer over 600 different programs, some uh, provided by us, some um, hosted. Um, and so I'm relatively new to this group, but have found every conversation to offer something very meaningful. So glad to participate. And uh, let's see who is left. Lauren, have you gone yet? I have not, thank you. My name is Lauren, uh, I'm in St. Louis. Uh, a former executive director, now spiritual entrepreneur. I um, do healing work at the intersection of theology and sexology. I am uh, one of the core consultants for the Racial Healing Initiative in which we're doing some retreats uh, with some of the, the retreat centers that are across the country. Uh, am I the last one, man? Still a couple more. Oh, Cheryl, did you raise your hand? And Susan, yeah. Okay, Cheryl, you can go. That was really fast, Lauren. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so my name is Cheryl Sesnon. Um, my background is uh, over 25 years working in nonprofits, but uh, almost exclusively with homeless men and women. And so for the last three years, I've been here at Harmony Hill Retreat Center. It's a retreat center that's a couple hours outside of Seattle in Union, Washington on beautiful Hood Canal. And we've got 11 acres here. We were founded by Gretchen Shada, who was a one of the first, um, well, she, she was a nurse practitioner way back in the early days. And uh, uh, she founded this based on compassion and healing. And right now our work focuses primarily on people with cancer. We do a free three-day cancer retreat for people who have cancer and their care companion. To come. It's professionally facilitated. We have uh, about 36 beds. Um, we're on Skokomish property, our uh, land. And uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about us? We, we do a lot of work around cancer healing. We also do a lot of work with healthcare professionals. And we did a little tiny bit before the pandemic, but once the pandemic hit, we really developed a lot of programs to help healthcare professionals both deal with trauma and also to renew themselves as they were going through uh, some of the craziness during the pandemic. Um, we also have a lot of wellness work that includes grief and loss, yoga meditation, things like that. Um, currently we do, um, our retreat center is pretty much busy all the time. We serve over 3000 people a year. And we do work virtually, and we also go into hospitals and do trauma workshops. And then additionally, we're growing into the Seattle area. We've just acquired another organization and we'll be doing work over in Seattle. And um, one of my big hopes with that is that we can begin expanding our offerings, especially around uh, underserved communities, people of color and, um, and some of the communities that are smaller so that they can come to free cancer retreats, um, whereas they wouldn't normally come out to Union, Washington, two hours outside of Seattle to a retreat center, but we can go into the city and create space and do retreats for um, groups there. So I'm looking for program managers who can create the curriculum from uh, for their own communities. So what we would do is hire people from particular communities to create the cancer retreat. Uh, experience based on kind of the foundation of what we've learned, but then making it culturally appropriate for their communities. 
So um, that's one of the directions we're going. The other is we're just in the process of hiring a research scientist that can help us take a look at some of the measurable um, outcomes from this type of work. So there's a lot of evidence pointing to the, the idea that meditation, yoga, mindfulness practices, building community, those kinds of things can really literally reduce the reoccurrence of cancer for people. And so we're, we're bringing on a research scientist who will be doing um, federally funded grants researching that exact kind of uh, line from the work we do to less cancer for people or redu reduced uh, occurrence of cancer for people. So we're in the process of doing that and we're beginning to look at some um, psilocybin retreats as a method for helping people who are ter terminally ill with cancer uh, be able to have a higher quality of experience for the rest of their lives. Um, so that's kind of what we're up to. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> and then, did you say Susan still hasn't gone? Susan? Yeah, but yeah thank you. So I'm Susan King. And um, some of you heard me speak before. I'm in the literally in the process of physically building a retreat and sanctuary house uh, on Beaver Island in the northern part of Lake Michigan. Um, my background is I'm actually a priest in a monastic Christian order that comes from the from the east, and I have. Um, been trained in working in interfaith work for years. I ran a interfaith dialogue organization in Southeast Michigan for about 20 years. And I have done, you know, led retreats and workshops for probably 25 years. And so the hope is to, well, one of the things that's in I think important to know is that Beaver Island is a very special place. Um, it has been documented that people have been using this island for sacred ceremony and gatherings for about 5,500 years. There are sacred sites on this island that are pretty profound. And so it has an atmosphere um, that is very conducive to spiritual and healing work. Uh, the house that we're building will hold will have five bedrooms. So it will hold 10 to 12 people for gatherings, but it is also designed being designed on two floors so that it can be used as a sanctuary house for people with grief. I'm already connecting with the um, hospice program here on the island the hospice program on the island is an in home so it's like this would be a place for families who are gathering will be able to have a place to stay i have a connection with um a suicidologist who will be sending people here and families who have just who have lost loved ones and especially children and also connections with the two major health systems um, up in northern Michigan for healthcare workers, etc. Um, and then my years of, of being clergy of a place for um, a, a very low cost um, sabbaticals for um, for people from across the uh, faith tradition. And then it'll also, it's also a site as a priory for my religious order. And when we have gatherings here, then my house, which will be sitting on the same um, land as the retreat house will open up again and can hold um, up to 30 people. Um, can we can we pause there, Susan? Yep, that's it. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, more conversations are welcome. I want to make sure that we have some time to get into some of this membership things. Um, 
really good to hear some threads here across all of our centers too. So if you all heard threads that I didn't hear, let me know. And if there are ways you want to connect, um, I hope you're direct messaging one another and figuring that out. But if you need me to help, <laughs> you can do that too. And I know other people are working on many similar things to what each of you are working on. So if there are other folks that you want to, to know how they're doing uh, new in their role or around psilocybin retreats or whatever it may be, um, let me know. Uh, for the next few minutes, I want to give you a, a short deck on what I've been working on in terms of a membership association model, just to kind of prime our thinking, very similar to what we talked about right at the outset. And then after that, I'm hoping that we can do a little um, dreaming, uh, brainstorming, kind of throwing things at the wall together um, to get more of your input of what you see RCC's purpose being, how you want to use RCC, how you would talk to your peers about RCC and what involvement might mean for them, and a little bit about what, what membership would make possible that maybe isn't possible now. So I've had some conversations about this, like I said, with the stewardship circle and the listening circle, but Yes, that's correct, Ken. <laughs> but dreamstorming with you all, I think, would uh, would bring it a little bit more into relief because you're all working at different centers and you all potentially would be members. So how you would use it would be really helpful for me to know. So let me share my screen here and put some of this deck in front of you. Place, yeah. Um, yes, Cheryl. Uh, I just have a quick question before we get into this. Can you just help me see a little bit better about the structure of RCC? Are you fiscally sponsored? Are you standalone 501c3? Um, I know you have some relationship with healing circles. I'm currently on that steering committee, and I know that we've done some pat things with you in the past. So, can you just put the kind mm -hmm. of that's great. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> RCC uh, started as a three-year program, uh, a project of the Fetzer Institute, and we did not have a fiscal sponsor per se. It was uh, kind of cobbled together. We were working with a few formative uh, what it found, founding organizations that were kind of collaboratively bringing it together. And over the course of the last year, we cleared up some of the messiness of that. And we have chosen a fiscal sponsor who takes care of all the grants. And so now I'm employed by that fiscal sponsor, which is Commonweal, located in California. Um, some of our funding comes from Fetzer, some comes from other sources. Uh, and so the future of our work is a little bit at risk, depending on what kind of future funding we find. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it soon, but we don't feel that a membership model is going to solve that problem. There's not enough money to be made in membership to make us financially viable without other funding. So it's it's only going to be supplemental. Um, but that's how it's structured right now. We have um, some really good existing relationships and some good ideas coming out of the work we've done so far that I think could turn into fundable programs or other projects. Um, but it is a little bit of a question mark as to how we do that when we aren't a formal membership association, uh, because it's sort of like, yeah, we're a learning community. We know each other. We're on a mailing list. You know, it's not that sticky. Um, so that's part of having this conversation is how do we how do we formalize in a way that actually makes sense and that comes out of our collaborative and and open um, exploratory approach. We've been a very emergent kind of a group where we've been learning from each other about what we want to do together in a way that has been really free and really luxurious because we've had this really generous funding from Fetzer, but that isn't guaranteed to continue. So how do we, how do we set ourselves up for this same kind of environment, this learning community or community of practice, um, while also recognizing that that alone will not be uh, a financially sustainable model, well, there, there are going to have to be many other forms of revenue for RCC. Does that answer your questions? Cool. Okay, so let me go back to this. Um, that's why we need each other's input. So thus far, it's been uh, this sort of idea that if you're on the mailing list, you're a member. 
and it's open to everyone. And over the past about a year, uh, there have been many conversations within the stewardship circle about how could we formalize this? How could we draw lines a little more clearly? Some of that was around the Mighty Networks platform, which is a great way for us to connect and has some, some boundaries kind of sketched in around who belongs here and who isn't really, this isn't really for them. Um, but that platform has not been very well utilized. Um, there maybe are better platforms and that platform doesn't speak to the idea of us identifying as members publicly or having public statements that come from us as an, as an association. So we've been thinking, how could we create a new membership and what kind of perks would be required? So I did some drafting around this and I brought it to the stewardship circle and they said, let's bring it to the listening circle. So I brought it to the listening circle, which is a much larger group, almost 20 people in our listening circle and showed them all these perks that I'd sketched out and all these different payment tiers. And I said, it looks really complicated and like kind of just confusing. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure how I would use it. And can we just start a little more softly and can we just do what needs to be done and then grow from there? So it seemed like too heavy of a lift and that's how we got to this conversation. So I, I spoke with the listening circle uh, maybe two weeks ago and that was some of the feedback. I'll share more on in a few more slides, but that's what we're looking at now is what will serve us best. And what is this future that we imagine together? Because I'm imagining one, the listening circle's imagining maybe 19 more and it'd be great to get your input as well. So currently we have 300, over 300 retreat centers on our mailing list, which is a little over 500 people. Um, we help retreat centers see the bigger picture, much like the conversations we're having on this call. So I've been getting feedback like uh, being in RCC reminds me to zoom out and see the bigger picture realities and invitations that exist for me. Um, being a part of RCC, maybe you could speak to this individually from your own experience, but it provides peer support. We establish what we feel are best practices and then exchange those with each other and kind of check them out. Is this what's working at your center around a staffing issue or whatever it may be? Um, and we identify areas for growth and innovation. And sometimes that's collaborative, sometimes it's not, um, but it's about finding out where our, our retreat centers can improve. Um, and that's that's been really generative for participants. Uh, what I hear is that it makes a difference for people at their centers, even if they're not involved real closely, just by being a part of the community at large. As I've been putting this together, my goal has been that a membership association model uh, could, could provide financial support for RCC. And it's only been more recently that we've done the math a few different ways and just found that there, there isn't really a way for that to, that to happen. <laughs> so... What is what else is there? And, and what we're now seeing is that it's actually more about establishing what our roles are, what our relationships are with each other, um, being able to have more public alignment on what our core values are, which I think there's some nominal or assumed alignment, but our core values have really made possible a lot of a lot of the work that we've done. So public alignment there, mutual accountability uh, has been a really interesting way to think about what's lacking in our current model and how that could be stronger. Uh, we could become more accountable to the commitments that we've made to how we want to run our centers or how we want to do this work. Um, it would allow us in some ways to go for funding as RCC in a way that benefits all participating centers, but we could do it as an association. We could say, with our 300 paying members, we want to run this program, which right now it's a little bit harder for us to say um, a statement like that. And then it would provide a, a stronger framework, uh, a stronger um, scaffolding for whatever future growth and innovation we want to do, because we can say, these are the members that are involved and we have their agreement and this is where we're headed. When I brought this uh, model to the listening circle, these are some of the things that I heard back from them a couple of weeks ago. They felt that it had value. The idea of membership sounded good to them. They weren't sure about the language. So some people brought forward the word collaborator instead of member. Some people brought forward the word investor, um, the idea that we're not just paying to receive something, but we're investing in something together. Um, wanted to make sure it's serving both people who are organizing programs, but also folks who are on the ground 
uh, really operating a, a large center and have some other challenges that aren't just related to organizing. Want to create venues for contribution that aren't just financial. So how do we how do we word that? How do we frame that to participants, to members? Uh, I got a little pushback about my my rush to get into membership. Like, let's take our time. Let's see. And then also some pushback on, but we don't have a lot of time. Uh, our funding isn't forever. So we do need to, to move into some sort of model. And then also wanting to make sure that we have a lot of transparency with between each other and to, to new folks coming in. I, I love that people lifted up the perspective of new folks coming in, that we really are clear on where the guidelines are, what we expect from members, who is a member, how you qualify to be a member, um, and, and how that would all work between us. One uh, exciting and, and uh, educational quote that came out of this group uh, was from Aaron Goggins. He shared that spaces that don't have criteria for membership become by default spaces for the majority dominant culture. And so really membership gives us that leg up on making sure that we're being accountable with each other on what we wanna be doing. Uh, so I really appreciate that. I, I can I can see that through the lens of equity practices, but I think there are a lot of different lenses that we could we could see that statement through. Uh, the ways that I've calculated it, it probably wouldn't be a lot more than twenty thousand dollars a year uh, that would come from membership dues. So it likely won't be a major source of revenue, um, but I think it's still worth it. It could provide basic benefits to all participants. We can make sure that it's not cost prohibitive to join. If it's not gonna be a huge revenue source, then maybe we just lower that bar. And hopefully we can create something that's able to scale appropriately with us. Uh, did a little sketching and pretending. Um, this is kind of leading us towards that, that dreaming and visioning. What kind of perks could we offer and who would get access to those? So you can see that already I'm thinking about moving past the Mighty Network into a private Facebook group, um, setting up collaboration hubs and cohorts for members is something we're already doing. We already have somewhat a digital resource library, but perhaps an intranet. And we don't have a member directory in quite the way that I think would be useful. So creating a, a public member directory with contact info and websites and photos all that stuff, that's a little bit more of a lift, but that's something we could work toward. Um, and we've been looking at other models that, that do something similar that's pretty, pretty simple, but could benefit everybody. And then some of the other uh, you know, things you see at associations, it, it gives you access to things that otherwise you might not have access to. So there are a lot of different ways we could think about that, program RFPs, um, hosting community convenings, those kinds of things. I'm really curious to hear what you think should be on this graph, not just what I've drummed up in my in my sketching. So that's the invitation is what what sparks come off of uh, what I'm sharing and what might you uh, imagine in terms of how you personally could benefit at your center. So I'll stop sharing there. Referrals have been important too. Can, do, can you speak a little bit more on what you meant by referrals have been important? Are you still there? Yeah, sure. So I've had, I've had groups contact me about renting our space and, and, and we've been busy. We haven't been able to serve every group. So I've actually pointed them to other groups around the nation based on that um, uh, network, based on this network, just, just being able to to point them to groups who are closer to them physically um, or, or who might also um, be in line with, with what they're trying to achieve um, through their retreat. So, so it's been important for me to say, we're not alone. We've got others that, that we can uh, direct you to who, who might be able to offer you services, offer you a, a retreat opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um. I've heard similar, actually, I think Jenna, I think you uh, and I spoke about this a little bit about some of your challenge when you were working with <laughs> with uh, trying to find retreat centers. Can you speak to that a minute about that? Um, why is there no one simple way so that I can compare apples to apples? <laughs> oh, that challenge. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a website. There are a variety, like when you do the Google search of like, 
find me a retreat center in this state. You can come across all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, a lot of the data is more just about where it exists and a link to the website, but not a robust comparison of um, and a transparent kind of perspective into what the offering is. Um, and there are so many organizations and just individuals doing this research on their own. Um, I just think there's tremendous value in, in centralizing it and, and also a space for those new retreat centers, which I think in this time, there will be many. Um, so how to really support those individuals getting up and off the ground and running, um, and attracting, you know, audiences to those places. Jenna, thank I. that's been my experience too, right? Looking at those different sites, I think having the Retreat Center Collaborative um, doing that, uh, providing that platform lends a, a credibility, right? With current information and, um, and, and to be a member in order to be listed on there, right? It helps offset the cost of doing that. But um, yeah, it's been frustrating looking at those different sites because oftentimes it's outdated. Those retreat centers don't even exist anymore. Um, or their model has changed, their pricing is, that's listed is, is incorrect. So it'd be really great to have a credible centralized place where you can compare apples to apples and see how places differ from one another. Because of the size of our group, I feel like there is some of this kind of conversation where we could just kind of pick up threads from each other. But I also want to make sure that we capture the full range of all the ideas that are popping up in each of our heads as we as we move through this and that we don't get get um uh narrowed into one way of thinking about it because there are a lot of different ways to think about this so i i've put together a little exercise here that i think might might work well for us a visioning exercise around six seven eight years down the road so i'm wondering if we can do this either in the chat or in a jam board are you all familiar with jam board is that something? yeah okay some of you are some of you are some of you aren't i'll put a jam board link in the chat um it is accessible to all so it won't be hard to get in there the hard part is um creating a sticky note and editing it on your own without editing someone else's sticky note <laughs> that's the only that's the only difficult part but don't feel like you have to jump in there if that's uh <laughs> too much to manage. We can also use the chat function right here in Zoom. Um, and then Aaron and I can can move things into a Jamboard. But if we, if we think about where RCC has been, and some of us have only been involved in RCC for a short time, but even using that as a, as a framework for your participation or what you wish your participation could be, eight years down the road, what would we what would we be wanting to put in front of new centers? I like Jenna was just saying, you know, for some of these new centers that are just coming in, um, to be able to give them a way to to speak to their audience and to identify what they offer to the world that's different from other centers. You know, those centers are also going to want to meet their peers and to know what's possible and to know what's really lasted through crisis and through uh, difficulty. So. RCC is going to be really valuable to those folks, but maybe for many reasons that we haven't spoken out loud yet. So what are you holding on to that's been important for you? And what are you thinking might be important for centers down the road uh, that would be a value for them participating in this community? So what do you tell them to get them excited about joining? And what does RCC offer? I'm especially interested in what RCC offers because I think we can backcast from there. So take a few minutes. Um, if you want to populate your own um, sticky notes, go for it. If you want to put some ideas in the chat, that works too. And before we go into more conversation, I'll also ask folks if they want to just verbalize to the group. That works as well. But we'll we'll give a couple minutes here. For folks who haven't used a Jamboard before, there's a sticky note button in the middle of the bar on the left side that you just double click and you have a new sticky note that you can type on.
And feel free to fill this page up. If we want, we can pop to the next page and there's more room. So as, as much as you want to say, I'm here to, I'm here to listen. <laughs> I think I might also say if there are things that you're getting out of RCC right now that you would hope would continue through the, the all the way through to be able to name those as well. How does that feel? Where are we at with thinking through that? Oh, yeah, more bubbling up. Heard a lot of these before. It's good to hear them again. Consistent.
Aaron and I had talked about um, clustering these for the group, but I wonder if the group might want to do some clustering of their own, <laughs> because I have my own little preconceived bias, and I'd be curious if there are things that you see as clusters that I might not. We don't have to start clustering if there's still more that's bubbling up for folks. I'm really appreciating the breadth that's here. What are folks thinking? Is there more still brewing here? I don't want to move us ahead if more is coming up. No? Might be in a good spot. Okay. And do we want to do some clustering? Who who feels like they might see some clusters? Are yeah. you able to put the whiteboard on the screen? I wasn't able to access it. My computer didn't let me in, so I haven't seen it. It'd be great if I could take a peek. Thanks. Ta -da. <laughs> there it is. Might be a little hard to read, but there's a lot going on there. And we can share this with the group after as well with the notes and everything. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyone want to offer just some verbal clusters that they've noticed? Since I couldn't get on the board, I'm going to go ahead and just say mine verbally. There's a lot of great stuff here. Um, I, I was just thinking through what inspires me to want to be a member of something. And there's usually some kind of, it's one of a number of different options. One is uh, like it's an association. And if you aren't a member, you feel left out, right? So that's kind of part of why this uh, RCC is important. Um, another is sometimes membership means that you can get creative ways on how to become more financially sustainable. And that's always a motivator, I think, for anybody running a, a program or a, a nonprofit. Education, training, um, ways to improve your culture. Um, anything having to do with capacity building is always a great incentive to belong to a group. Um, and I noticed that I approach my work, there's the business side of it, and then there's the heart side of it. And anything that would enhance either of either of those or ways that those can come together better is motivating. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Pamela. I see, yeah, I see Susan left as well. Uh, Aaron, do you want to speak to what you're seeing in terms of clusters? Um, I'm seeing a lot of mention of just the the rich resources as far as connections, um, looking to the future and learning to make space for people who have been excluded thus far from retreat center spaces. Um, and thinking about the staff as well as people who are attending. Um, place for asking questions. Couple mentions of the directory in the bottom left maybe a different kind of directory there, the two different styles. This uh, grant model where the grant funding goes to RCC and then uh, centers participate in it, that's, that's kind of a new edge for us that we're learning about right now. Yeah, and I can imagine in eight years that that could be a pretty um, juiced up system that would be rolling right along. Yes, um, Lauren has pointed out in the chat, the um, there's an emerging landscape kind of cluster and then the capacity building and professional development cluster. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Programs and outreach as a third. Yeah. I wonder if there are any pieces that we see here that we could color code as being um, sooner than later, like sort of chronological in development. I'd be curious what what jumps out at folks. I mean, things like the peer collaboration groups, in some ways, those are already happening. Yeah. Maybe too soon to do to go that into that far into it. Well, I think the education training is, I mean, it, it is happening. There's been trainings all along and recordings are available now as I would hope they'd be in the future. Um, invitations I know have already been happening, visiting other retreat centers for relationship building in person. Thanks, Scott. Take care. I love this idea about having staff in key roles be able to talk to other staff in key roles. I was just reading that and feeling the same thing. Like that's been I love that. Yeah, but we haven't done that. That's that would be really cool. And that that maybe is not a community call, but it's something like a community call, like, hey, we're gonna have all these folks together. Yeah. Really cool. Very doable. I think especially as different retreat centers are organized differently, like the Whidbey Institute is practicing holacracy, other retreat centers are practicing other things. So communications managers and different counterparts meeting and discussing both how their organization is set up and, and their part in that. Mm 
yeah, I could see that being empowering that they could see how other folks are making decisions and the impact of those and how they could do it at their own organization. Yeah. Well, Marta, since we're neighbors, we can just make that happen. <laughs> I've been wanting to do a, a all staff field trip to Whidbey anyway, so. Oh, that would be great. Where are you located, Cheryl? Or Harmony Hill uh, in Union on Hood Canal. That would be wonderful. Let's yeah, talk. I've been talking about it for a long time. It'd be really fun. Let's talk. Mm, I'm wondering if there's another, I'm going to stop my share here so that I can look at my notes. There we go. I'm wondering if there's another way we could ask. Um, the question to, to um, drill down just a little bit tighter. One, one way we could think about it is, are there any pieces of those clusters, maybe like the clusters, the way Lauren was, was framing them, the emerging landscape, the capacity building and professional development, and then the programs and outreach. Are there any specific ways that we could go further into that and say, are there pieces that are missing or are there, uh, is this something that's been central to RCC in the past or would it be a big lift? You know, those kinds of like feeling into, is that cluster really defining are, are we naming everything that that could be named? I, I really like the the generative aspect of of how we've been holding it, and I just don't want to lose if there are little pieces that you could contribute here in this moment. <laughs> um, one way we could do that is to split into smaller uh, discussions, or we could just spend a few minutes on each each of those. Since there aren't that many of us, we could even just spend a couple minutes on each of those segments the way Lauren named them. Um, I can't see the chat when I'm here. Where did it go? There it is. Emerging landscape. Aaron, can you help me see where emerging landscape might be sitting? Or Lauren, if you if you have it. Mm -hmm. There seem to be um, some comments about like visioning and um, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, in the middle here. Mm -hmm. I see in the upper right hand corner, um, succession planning, transition to BIPOC queer leadership, mm -hmm. um, radically inclusive retreat centers. Uh -huh. There's one about, well, this could be lumped into workshops of emerging models for operation. I mean, that could go in that first bucket or the one about right. programs or something like that. <clears throat> so the research piece is kind of emerging models as well. Oh, yes, this, this maybe is a little bit different, this research piece, but yeah, I think special topics, operational models, yeah. Maybe education, training, and improving culture. I feel like that's the second one. I think that's capacity building and professional development, but maybe, I, maybe I'm maybe i not capturing it quite the way that you, I think that was something that you had verbalized out loud, um, Cheryl, education, training, improving organizational culture. There's one at the bottom that says, support with both specific and big picture questions and ideas. Yeah. Yep. 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 Let's pause there with those and let's try the second bucket, uh, capacity building and professional development and see if we might gather some things there. I think this would be one of those. Yeah. 
this is more of an outreach. Capacity building. Oh, surprise, another one. <laughs> surprise. Another one. <laughs> Capacity building grant writing resources that could that could be in here. Uh -huh. And then the mention of mentors and the mention of regional resiliency hubs, they seem to fit too. Uh -huh. Yeah, where are those? Oh, regional resilience hubs, yes. That up. Programs. Programs. Ben, would it help if I uh, change the color in some of these to help group? That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I just um, access to knowing the specific mission of many types of centers for cross cross collaboration and referrals to each other might be programs and outreach there. This I feel is professional development. This could be professional development. I think this actually belongs over here. There's kind of a peer community, uh, community of practice element here. Are we feeling like that fits in with capacity building? I feel like this, this is like a collaborative piece that capacity building sort of gets at it, but not quite here. boilerplate policies have been mentioned before, um, along with different models to share staffing. So that that's interesting that that keeps coming up. We we've we keep hinting at it. We've like we've tried some things on Google Drive. It'd be yeah, that would be a real benefit of of having an association would be able to say this is something we've all agreed on. Thank you, Ken. Good to see you. Marta, any other wisdom you want to impart? <laughs> oh, this looks great. I mean, I feel like it really builds on the on what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It's really going in. Yes. Yep. That's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks for color coding, Lauren. Yeah. I love the the structure that you you know have already created with the um, 
steering committee and a listening group so, so that these layers keep getting deeper and deeper. Ah, yeah, yeah, good. Huh? I give credit to Diana for her <laughs> excellent uh, professional learning and evaluation skills that she has passed on to us that we sort of just naturally are running with. Uh, Diana Scarce. I'm going to stop sharing here. Thanks, Aaron, for helping with mm -hmm. all that. I'm sure we're going to be looking at that some more. Um, I'll be bringing what we kind of what we've gone through and some of Aaron's notes uh, back to the group um, and back to the stewardship circle in particular as we look at what our next steps are. But I, uh, I'm curious to see how we can start like the little baby steps now, including getting out of Mighty Networks and into something that's a little more level playing field for folks across generations. We have very little participation uh, from most RCC members in Mighty Networks, and I feel like they're in Facebook, and we're going to get them participating a little bit more if we move to Facebook. So that's one piece of this puzzle that's not smooth. It's <laughs> <laughs> like no, no quick solution. I have a question, Ben. <clears throat> How many of the members would you say come on the Zoom calls? You know, maybe per oh, month. Months? Very small. I mean, if we have 500 members and typically there's around 25 people on a community call and that varies quite a bit. I mean, we might have 75 or 80 people that come to community calls uh, staggering, but really that's that's like 20% of the people who could be coming. If, if that it might even be a little bit less than that. So. And do you feel like those other people are accessing the blog recordings more? I so? think I don't know that they're accessing the recordings. I think they are accessing the newsletter and I think they are um, kind of like dipping in when it benefits them. So if there's a topic that kind of flags them, I think they are dipping in and I'm getting kind of surprising threads where I'll send something out and they'll, someone will forward it to someone. And then I get an email back. Hey, I'm curious about this. It's like, how did you find out about this? So I think the network actually is more interconnected than we can visibly track, mm -hmm. um, which is great. So there are, I think a lot of opportunities for if we formalize those connections will become a little bit more clear because it'll be like, oh yeah, maybe you want to become a member. And we'll be able to see like, okay, members are participating in these ways, which right now it's just like the edges are so fuzzy. We're saying we have 500 people, but really, I mean, if we're talking active members, it might be more like 85. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for attending this community call. I'm going to stop mm -hmm. our recording. <laughs>